and a very warm welcome to all of you watching us from wherever you are around the world. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Louise Eklund. I'm a journalist and I'm absolutely thrilled to be your host today. And I'm very proud on behalf of RTL AdConnect to unveil the results of their very first international study on responsible brands in Europe and consumers' expectations in terms of engagement and environment. Over the next 60 minutes or so, we'd like to give you a good glimpse of how brands, media and advertisers are actually stepping up to meet the consumer's expectations in terms of sustainability. And we'll be doing this with in-house experts and also external experts from international brands and media partners. Now, you may be asking yourself why I'm standing in front of this teepee next to a railway station. Well, let's set the scene. Hello, Emily. Hello, Louise. Welcome to Les Fertile. Thank you so much. So we're in Pantin, which is a suburb just outside of Paris, and you are the public relations manager exactly. here. Tell us about the concept and the idea behind this wonderful place. <laughs> so La Cité Fertile is one of the most ambitious agricultural third place here around Paris. Uh, it used to be an old freight station, yeah. which we renovated back in 2018. We are in the courtyard, so you can actually see the train and the old rail from here. Mm -hmm. We transformed this place into um, indoor, outdoor spaces dedicated to preserving the environment and having a positive impact on society. So there's a lot of different activities. You can work, garden, learn how to uh, do some stuff. Well, it sounds amazing. I'll have to come here more often. <laughs> um, well, I guess the Cité Fertile is subject to COVID restrictions like everywhere in France at the moment. So this doesn't really reflect a normal sunny day in April, does it? No, not really. Uh, La Cité Fertile usually offers a wide range of activities seven days a week. But for the moment, it's mostly a workplace. So we have students, a lot of professional, and I'm going to introduce you to someone called Maxim, who's working here. Okay, I'm following you. Let's go. Oh, so here he is, Maxim. So Amelie was just telling me all about you. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, Louise. Nice to meet you. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about your project, um, Crush On. Exactly. So Crushon is the European marketplace for professional second uh, fashion sellers. And so we are basically committed into making sustainable consumption the new norm. And with this mission, we basically democratize circular fashion by connecting professional second hand sellers with activist consumers all around the world. So today we're 50,000 uh, people uh, online uh, getting monthly and we help them find sustainable, affordable and uh, unique fashion uh, items online. Okay, well, thanks, Maxime. I'll let you get back to work. Thank you very Fantastic. much, Fantastic. It's now time to roll out the red carpet for the RTL AdConnect survey on responsible brands in Europe. And to launch this first edition, I'm thrilled to have with us Stéphane Corruble, CEO of the International Advertising Sales House, live from Luxembourg. Stéphane, Really great to have you with us. Uh, I believe you're stuck at headquarters for obvious reasons. Hi, Louise. Very nice to uh, meet you. Indeed, I'm speaking from my office here in, uh, in Luxembourg, and I wish I could be with you in this very nice setting in uh, Pantin, uh, close to Paris. Uh, not so long ago, I was taking the plane every time and several times during the week, but times are changing for the better, I guess, and at least for a, a greener planet. And that's why we are here today. And that's why I'm very proud to uh, reveal our first survey about responsible brands in Europe, about consumer behaviors towards sustainability and brand ethics, which are two key growing topics for the moment. Very exciting. So I guess our audience is looking forward to learning more about these great insights. So Stefan, tell us about the concept of the survey, first of all. Sure. Um, basically, we are helping international advertisers to navigate the European markets and to understand local uh, specificities. Um, this has whole, always been part of our DNA at RTL at Connect. Uh, as I said earlier, with sustainability becoming a central topic uh, in marketing strategies, it was really natural for us to provide a deeper understanding of what it meant for European customers and consumers. So in October last year, in collaboration with our media partner in France, MCIS, 
we commissioned uh, an institute called Institute Social Vision. It's part of the IFOP group to carry out one of a kind, one of a kind quantitative survey across four European countries, uh, France, Germany, UK, and Italy. In each of those countries, we uh, basically we have 1,000 people representative for the whole population. And those people answered a, five, a 15 minute survey questionnaire with questions on three topics. Uh, the awareness, their awareness of the, uh, of the sustainability topic and how they use media as a source of information. The second is about the shift or their potential shift of their consumption habits across four key sectors, food, beauty, mobility, and fashion. And finally, what was their perception towards engaged brands and advertising? So all those insights are supporting our recommendation for addressing each market in respect of local expectations. And how specific is the European market that you are so familiar with at RTL Ad Connect, Stefan? Well, Europe is a uh, beautiful region, but it is a very fragmented market. Each country has its own culture, its own language, different consumption habits, local preferences regarding content and different expectations when it comes to uh, many topics. When addressing the European audiences, advertisers have to take into consideration and adapt to these local discrepancies. And this is what we will discover today in our new study. And this will be uh, once again confirmed. According to our research, global awareness of the climate crisis is quite strong and pretty even across countries. But there are more and more discrepancy when it comes to understanding the different aspects or the ecological crisis like carbon footprint, for example, or digital pollution. Annabelle, in a minute, and uh, along with uh, Jean-Baptiste, will give you uh, more details about the trends we observed uh, uh, during this, uh, over this survey. Well, thanks so much, Stefan, for giving us the big picture on this survey. It was great chatting to you, and I'll let you get back to business in Luxembourg. So we've just been taking a look at the international part of this survey on responsible brands. Let's now focus on the French part. Bonjour Annabelle Bully, comment ça va Bonjour Louis, ça va très bien. Super, alors vous êtes la directrice des études d'M6 Publicité et j'aimerais revenir avec vous tout d'abord sur la genèse de la grande étude que vous avez initiée en 2019 je crois. Alors depuis un peu plus de deux ans maintenant, nous sommes beaucoup challengés, questionnés par nos partenaires à la fois agences médias et annonceurs pour les accompagner sur leur prise de parole RSE et c'est vrai que nous les accompagnons à travers des dispositifs sur mesure. Alors pour vous donner deux chiffres très intéressants, Louise. Le premier, c'est qu'en 2019, les campagnes RSE représentaient 9% des investissements télé. En 2020, c'est 15%. Ah oui On a presque doublé. Donc c'est un signal quand même qui montre à quel point aujourd'hui, pour nous, en tout cas régie publicitaire, il est important, voire stratégique, de pouvoir dresser un état des lieux des comportements engagés en France pour mieux accompagner nos, nos clients. Si on se place uniquement du côté de la France, quels sont les principaux enseignements que vous tirez de cette deuxième édition Alors sur cette deuxième édition, euh, je dirais qu'il y a cinq enseignements principaux. D'accord. Alors le premier, c'est que les marques et les, les chefs d'entreprise sont vraiment des, des acteurs aujourd'hui majeurs et reconnus pour faire changer les comportements. Mmh. Deuxième constat qu'on a pu... Euh, qu'on a pu étudier, c'est que cette crise sanitaire, elle a eu un effet d'accélérateur extrêmement important, voire de déclencheur auprès des populations qui étaient moins engagées. Le troisième, il concerne les marques responsables et la capacité des Français à les reconnaître. Mmh. Et on s'est aperçu que euh, eh bien, les Français, aujourd'hui, avaient plus de facilité à reconnaître les marques responsables. Et ça, c'est lié à ce que je vous disais, Louise, en introduction, parce qu'il y a eu un effet d'accélération des communications des, des marques sur leur engagement. Très bien. Ensuite, on a évidemment des nouveaux défis en tant que, que marque, citoyen et entreprise à relever. Il s'agit de l'empreinte carbone et de la pollution numérique. Mmh. Donc là, les attentes sont, sont fortes. Et en France, on s'aperçoit que voilà, les, les Français souhaitent agir, mais de façon assez, assez limitée encore. Et on a pu observer qu'à peine un quart d'entre eux souhaitaient donc, euh, ralentir ou en tout cas moins consommer donc, des vidéos en streaming ou euh, souhaitaient éventuellement... Donc, euh, 
euh, avoir une, une qualité de, de vidéo moindre. Donc on est encore très loin d'engagement très fort à ce sujet. Un petit peu de travail à faire encore. Et encore. cinquième Et alors le cinquième, on va revenir à la communication. Les communications responsables jusqu'à présent étaient très attendues sur des critères de preuve, de mmh. transparence. Et ce qui est très nouveau cette année, c'est que les Français souhaitent aussi une tonalité, un registre plus positif et plus divertissant. Mmh. Donc un peu moins de culpabilité dans les publicités ou en tout cas les communications des marques à ce propos. Toujours côté français, quelles sont les grandes évolutions que vous avez pu observer depuis 2019 et quels sont les indicateurs dont les lignes ont bougé de manière, on va dire, importante alors, on a euh, un enseignement qui a été pour nous extrêmement intéressant, c'est que les comportements ont majoritairement bougé sur le secteur des services, qui était un secteur qui, était, qui avait moins évolué ces dernières années, alors que l'alimentation ou, ou l'hygiène beauté étaient vraiment les secteurs prioritaires pour, pour les Français. Donc, être client d'une banque ou d'une assurance éthique et solidaire euh, obtiennent les meilleures progressions, respectivement de 6 et, euh, et de 10 points. Donc, c'est vraiment très important. Mmh. Ensuite, les Français donc, euh, souhaitent également euh, privilégier des préoccupations euh, sur le bien-être animal, sur, euh, sur l'éthique, le commerce équitable. Mmh. Ce sont vraiment euh, deux, euh, deux leviers qu'ils privilégient aussi euh, cette année. L'achat des vêtements L'achat des vêtements. Alors, je ne sais pas si, Louise, vous avez une veste euh, de ce moment Moi, j'ai une veste récupérée d'occasion. Ben, ben voilà, vous êtes complètement <rire> dans les tendances de ces nouveaux comportements et qui touchent notamment les, les femmes. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on a une grande majorité donc, euh, des Français qui achètent des vêtements d'occasion. Et ce qui est intéressant, c'est que ce, cette évolution de la seconde main concerne maintenant tous les grands secteurs d'activité. Mmh. Et dernier point en termes d'évolution assez intéressant qu'on a pu aussi euh, mettre en perspective, c'est que euh, l'autopartage ou la location de véhicules progresse également de façon très significative et même deux fois plus que celle de l'achat des véhicules électriques et hybrides. Alors, je sais que cette année, vous avez élargi l'étude à, à l'échelle européenne, en partenariat évidemment avec RTL AdConnect. Pourquoi avoir euh, élargi Alors, pourquoi déjà Tout simplement parce que euh, nombreux de nos annonceurs donc, euh, communiquent et, euh, et sont présents sur les marchés européens. Et puis parce que la, cette problématique hein, de responsabilité sociale, économique et environnementale, elle est bien sûr globale et elle ne touche pas que le marché français. Donc, c'est très important pour nous. Euh, à la fois M6 Publicité et puis euh, en tant que représentante hein, des, des études, de bien comprendre également donc, euh, comment évoluent les comportements engagés à l'échelle internationale et ainsi mm -hmm. que les, les initiatives des marques. Merci beaucoup Annabelle. Thank Merci you very much bien. for sharing uh, the vision of M6 on this great partnership. So now that we've whet your appetite with the outlines, let's move on to the main course of the event. Of course, it's the study itself. And to give us a thorough and detailed analysis, I'm with Jean-Baptiste Modio. You are RTL AdConnect's Head of Marketing. How are you doing? Great to see you again. Yeah, hi, Louise. I'm super glad to be with you again today on this very special occasion. So I understand you are the master of the European part of the study. Um, can you tell us about its methodology, first of all? Yeah, sure, Louise. So to get a global picture of sustainable behavior and expectations across Europe, we define a series of key questions and ask to a representative panel of 1,000 respondents across the four countries. As Stefan Korub already mentioned, all the results can be broken down by ages, regions, etc. I see. So what's the main purpose of this ambitious project? Well, as a mass media, our role is to depict the cultural state of the markets we are in, but also to inform and raise awareness. So the idea was to sound out uh, awareness to our sustainability in the different countries where we run the study so that we could address it as broadcasters. And first of all, we learned that ecological crisis is not a local concern. No. There is a general concern across Europe related to this topic as more than 70% of our respondents acknowledge that we are going through a serious ecological crisis. But then we started to dig deeper into the ecological concerns of the European audience. And this is where some discrepancies started to appear. Italians, for example, uh, they had the lowest level of awareness of the carbon footprint concept. Another example, we also discovered that the British respondents, for more than half of them, were not aware about digital pollution unlike 80% of their French counterparts. That is a huge gap, actually. Yes, it is. But however, the global expectations towards media publisher were rather unanimous for all countries. 
a large majority of European audiences are expecting to see more media content related to this topic to help them understand the issue, of course, but also to be advised on how to deal with it. Okay, so concretely, how can broadcasters meet these consumer expectations, tell us? Well, first by getting back to our basics, okay. which is to offer the most accessible and understandable information to the larger audience. As we already for every topic we cover, let's take a look at this format from ITV in the UK, which uses the codes of weather forecast to raise the awareness about global warming. Okay, let's take a look. Our climate is changing. Rising temperatures and extreme weather events around the world are putting animal and human lives at risk. And in May last year, the UK Parliament declared a national climate emergency. But what does that mean? What is the emergency? For that, we need to understand the basics. So let's start at the beginning. First of all, here is Earth. It holds everything we've ever known, every animal, every plant, every human being, and it is actually very fragile. For a perfect world, we need everything to be in balance, and the world gets all of its energy from the sun, that heats the Earth up, and then it radiates that back into space. And if everything that comes in is the same as everything that goes back out again, the world is in balance, and the temperature on Earth here won't change. But if the energy or heat that comes in isn't the same as what goes out, if some of it is trapped, then we are unbalanced and that is when we start to warm. So why is the world warming? There are so many ways of addressing the topic, yeah. so many subtopics of sustainability that we can tackle and educate the audience about. In Germany, for instance, the Bertelsmann Content Alliance, who's joining the force of television, print and digital media, is rolling out an increasingly recurring schedule of special sustainability weeks across its media channels under the umbrella brand Packen vs. An, or in English, let's tackle it. Okay. It's the same for M6 in France that launched a yearly Green Week, rebranding all its flagship magazines. And what's the feedback maybe on these initiatives? Well, by running research about the added value of such content for the audience, they both get very positive feedback. Whether it be on the ability of such content to raise awareness, or to provide concrete solutions to act more sustainably. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Um, doesn't all video content have a carbon footprint, even if it is sustainable? Yes, 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 uh, it does. You're right, Luis. So internet, if we count the, the carbon emission, it accounts for 3.45% of the global carbon emission. That's why uh, in the UK, again, the key uh, video players, they have launched a joint initiative partnering with scientists and consultants to plug a calculator into their video platforms as a solution to reduce the footprint. Mm -hmm. um, we met up with Jane Atkinson, she's SVP of Global Production Fremantle, to ask her how her company has managed to make her activity a lot greener. So Albert is an initiative that's existed in the UK for 10 years. Um, it was created by the BBC who realised uh, that they had to find a resource that could track the carbon footprint emissions of uh, productions. And actually that's all it did in the very beginning. It was, a, it was a function to be able to report on. It wasn't really even a method for change because nobody knew what to do with the data. And actually as it's happened, it's taken a year for Albert to create an international calculator but every single one of our production teams around the world now uses that calculator. It was only launched in January this year, mm -hmm. but they've all started using it. The biggest issue for any production is power and energy. And Albert's position is always that the point at which you can get to use renewable energy is, is a huge footprint. It's a huge game changer. That's where you can start. And then in other areas of television production, we're talking about using LED lights instead of tungsten. If you're a production that relies heavily on a catering service, consider a vegetarian or vegan caterer day once every week. There's often more that people can do on a small scale and they don't understand, but the impact is on the, is on the top end and the power and the energy that we're using. We know we have 
created a world, uh, we all know this, where we can connect digitally. So there'll be areas where we will still gain from that in things like online casting and being able to get hold of our, the people that we would previously travel to speak to, probably in a pre-production phase. There's a reality we still need people in studios and we still need people to turn up for filming, so we will still be travelling people. But we know there are better ways of working and different ways of working. We have um, government and business parameters that we have to adhere to and reporting our carbon footprint is one of those to our broadcasters. They, as purchase of programmes, also are responsible for their carbon footprint and as we are key suppliers, we have to be able to supply them with that data. So for us, it is a global approach. We can um, see that some countries are already far ahead. The Nordics are very far ahead. Germany has a good position. It has a good history of um, renewable energies. So we, and, and the UK, who's been managing this for some time. So we can see that uh, people have initiatives in play already that we're adapting and bringing into the Albert system. And another example is for X Factor, they film their auditions in effectively a big circus tent outside. And they had heard of a fabric that was being used on um, buildings that were being renovated that absorbed pollution. It was part of the building contractor's responsibility to use this fabric almost like as a screen, but it absorbed pollution from the roads. And they integrated that into the tent fabric as well. So it, it's not even the most obvious story that we're hearing, it's other stories that people are using. And that comes from a personal desire and an interest interest in, in being able to be better programme makers. So we've just seen the first part of how the media reflect the desire for more sustainability and how they adapt to the new ecological challenges. But what about the brands? And that's what we're going to be seeing right now in the second part of our study. So just like people's mindset, consumer behaviour is also changing a lot nowadays, which is I guess a big challenge for brands as well. Yeah, indeed, Louise. Just like the media, brands also have to adapt to this new reality. And to do so, they need to capture the essence of change. Globally, of course, but also locally. As for the global awareness of the ecological crisis, the shift towards responsible consumption habits is a reality across all European markets, as more than 80% of consumers declare that they are taking a lot of actions to be more sustainable. Mm. But again, it's time to dive below the surface in order to understand what lays behind the concept of taking a lot of actions. Okay. For this, we have listed 38 sustainable consumption actions across four sectors. Food, fashion, hygiene and beauty, mobility and tourism. And we have asked our respondents from each country which ones they were actually taking. Based on the results, we created radar infographics to depict one, which are the most popular actions per sector, and second, which countries are most advanced regarding sustainable actions in each sector. Here's a, a simple tip to help you read the diagram. The larger the spider web, the more sustainable. So out of these four different sectors, we'll make a start with our most basic needs, which is obviously food. What are the key figures in this sector, Jean-Baptiste? Yeah, well, Louise, it's a, it's a basic need, but uh, our dietary habits, they account for 18% of our carbon emissions. So in this sector, we see that the most popular action are the purchase of seasonal and local products, and that Italy and France are the most advanced territories. This doesn't so much come as a surprise, since their southern location in Europe allows for a greater vi variety of seasonal products. But there is another key structural difference. Italy has 15% of its farming area dedicated to organic product. That's twice the average of the European Union, and that's six times more than the UK figure. Don't forget that the Italians, they are the ones who initiated the slow food slow movement. Food, yes. Yeah, to promote local products grown in respect of nature. Mm -hmm. Another key point of this graph is the meat consumption. Uh, you may know that beef protein, they generates about 40 times more carbon emissions than tofu, for example. We've also identified, thanks to the research, that 37, that 37 of the respondents were interested in eating less meat or replacing it with something else. But they found it difficult to put into practice. So we see an increasing number of traditional meat producers that are repurposing themselves as tomorrow's leader to produce vegan meat. 
such as the German sausage producer Rügenwalder Mühl. I don't know if you know Rügenwalder Mühl, Luis. You pronounce it very well, though. <laughs> well, they started in, in 2015 and they saw their sales of vegan meat increasing by 70% okay. in 2020. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not only about the product itself, but it's also about the packaging. It matters a lot. We see that single-use plastic is a well-identified matter for all Europeans and that all the retailers take action either by collecting plastic or promoting reusable packaging. So we've just talked about food. Let's move on to beverages now. Um, how does a traditional Italian brand like Illy Cafe adapt to the current context? Let's take a look. Uh, our mission is uh, driven by a, a strong conviction. Quality begins uh, at the start of our chain and on the plant itself. Quality and sustainability is connecting each other because from the very start, Illis Cafe strategies has follow a sustainability business that uh, uh, can give the company a competitive advance with environmental and social aspects. Illy launches a new initiative named One Makes the Difference, showing how sustainability quality helps protect and improve the well-being of the planet and the remain of consumer that everyone's action can make the difference. The new eco-friendly disposable items like uh, plastic cups that we used in the past, we started with the recyclable paper to go cups available in all Illy bars, Illy bar, Illy coffee, direct stores, in a vending machines, allow for uh, a reduction in use of plastic equal to 175 tons per year of plastic. Currently, we, we, we communicate our sustainability strategy and products uh, through the communication platform with the hashtag One Makes the Difference and uh, in order to have a direct contact with all the social media platforms. Obviously, the sustainability has to be uh, explained to be in a trusted way. And so in this case, the, the, um, the communication is a little bit more technical, deeper, in order to have a transparent and clear definition of the content. If an organization does not align the business model related to how you make money with prosperity for people and the planet, it's a very difficult to have any significant or sustainable impact and it falls in greenwashing. Illy Cafe has become the first Italian coffee company to obtain the B Corp certification award to companies that meet the highest standard for social and environmental performance and transparency and responsibility. Time to move on now to an industry segment that's been unfortunately really hardly hit by the COVID-19 crisis. It's transportation. Yes, Louise, you're right. 2020 was a very special year everywhere as it limited the opportunity to do carpooling and the use of public transport was reduced by the social distanciation. But Before the crisis, the transportation accounted for 27% of our carbon emissions. Now, new private vehicles, greener, emerge like bicycles. They are an excellent alternative for commuters, especially in Germany, where the traffic was multiplied by four during this period. In this market, Business Bike, for example, is providing an innovative company leasing solution for employees willing to commute by bike. But mobility isn't only about our daily commuting. Of course. It's also about where we spend our holidays. And on that topic, we see that the French and the Italians are the most likely to remain in their home country. Actually, it's more a habit than a real sustainable behavior. It's opposed to the German tourist, for example. There are four times more international departures and they don't seem ready to give up their holidays abroad. Okay. However, for international tourists, eager to reduce their environmental impact, an increasing number of destinations take action to be more respectful of the environment, like the amusement park Porta Ventura that claimed to be the first carbon neutral European park at the end of last year. Let's talk about the look, about the style now. How are our four countries doing fashion-wise? Well, with 80 billion pieces of textile 
produced yearly and a huge volume of water consumption plus a high risk of water pollution, the fashion industry is under close scrutiny. Here again, we observe a high growth uh, of the potential for the currently limited second-hand market, as respectively 34 and 43 percent of consumers are interested to buy and sell second-hand clothes, but they find it difficult to do in practice. This emerging market is addressed by pure players that are creating some marketplaces, uh, Vinted, Vestiaire Collective, etc., but also by the more traditional fashion e-commerce company, such as VP or La Redoute, for example, that are integrating second-hand options into their offering. But beyond the environment, the fashion sector also has to reconsider its social impact as consumers become increasingly aware of potential mistreatment of employees and suppliers. The demand for label verified and exploitation free brands is huge, more than 50% in Europe. E-commerce giant Zalando, for example, is tackling the matter by committing to increase the share of green label clothes in their offering by 2023. The next sector now is the beauty sector. What are the new trends, Jean-Baptiste? Well, Louise, the dominant actions, they are focusing on natural products if possible, made from organic ingredients and preferably locally produced. As you can see, Germany and France, they already have a high share of these natural beauty products in their domestic markets. But what makes the Italian more likely to buy organic and local product is the identity of domestic brands that provide these products in their market. And among them, Kiko, the Milano makeup brand, is developing towards more responsibility, of course, in its offer. And we met up with marketing manager Giorgia. She's going to tell us more. Take a look. Kiko is a brand that was born in 1997 and is, uh, it was born as a brand for everybody, a very democratic brand. We're selling cosmetics. Uh, we are the number one uh, makeup brand uh, in Italy and we are uh, 900 uh, stores around the world. We look at corporate social responsibility as a series of action across multiple areas. Internally, we have broken this into Kiko Conscious, Kiko Cares, and Kiko Contributes. Within Kiko Conscious, uh, we have developed an eco-friendly lineup, which is called Green Me, and we are keeping on uh, doing improvement in uh, sustainable packaging design and the lowering our environmental burden. We know we are still far away from where we want to be, but we are keeping on uh, doing our best efforts to continue to improve. Through Green Me, uh, that was originally an eco-friendly collection, and now it has been incorporated into our permanent selection and is growing as a line year after year, we are giving our consumer the possibility to make a more sustainable choice. This lineup is based on natural ingredients, the packaging is also recyclable or recycled, and uh, we continue to make strides across multiple products by reducing waste, eliminating unnecessary double caps, and with other multiple more efforts that add up. This uh, is really now a global effort. It is true that the European consumer has sustainability as a top of mind when purchasing product, but it is not, not just the European uh, consumer that cares about sustainability. And I would say that it's not really us, the companies that are educating the consumer, it's the other way around. I would say that the companies are being educated by the consumer. We offer our sustainable uh, solutions, uh, but uh, this comes uh, and as a an answer to their demands and hopes. Actually, it was uh, so welcomed by our consumers that we decided to make it uh, a part of our permanent uh, uh, range. So I would say that uh, the consumer was there waiting for us to do this. So it was not just uh, we proposing them something. They were ready, uh, knowing what they wanted and uh, and uh, they were really asking for that. We have one planet and uh, uh, we really need to all to make uh, our efforts uh, uh, as uh, people and as companies to work into that direction. And finally, since digital pollution applies to all categories, are the consumers ready to shop in their local stores rather than online to limit carbon footprint? Well, it depends on the country. 
Germans and French are more eager to do so than Italian and British consumers. And e-retail leaders are more and more committed to address digital pollution. Let's take a look at this Amazon spot, for example. And to discuss now how we can turn digital pollution into digital sustainability, we met up with Hannah Wicks, CMO of Ecosia. Ecosia is Europe's largest search engine um, and we're based out of Berlin. We were founded about 11 years ago and we're a tree planting tech company, which are two very different worlds. And what that means is that we have 15 million users globally using our search engine. They use it to search every normal, everyday thing that they want to find, but we don't keep the revenues for ourselves. All of our profits go directly into climate action. So 80% into tree planting, but 100% into climate action. And that can also mean investments in renewable energy and things like that as well. It's global growth. I think the growth, interestingly, Paris has been one of our major cities, is our biggest city in terms of installs and growth. And we see huge traction there, despite the fact that a lot of our team is based in Germany. Um, and France has always been such a strong performer for us. We've also invested in some regenerative agroforestry and agriculture projects there, where we're starting to see the first results of what we're doing. And people have really connected with that. So for them, food and where it comes from and connection to food is super important. Well, I think in the UK, it often centers around shopping and, and what you're buying, zero waste, plastics, like there's different topics which resonate with different audiences. And often we see that a certain user base starts, like a younger user base gets really excited about it, but they are our, our, our advocates. And so they're the ones that tell their parents, um, they're the ones who tell their colleagues, they're the ones that switch their workplaces across their universities to Ecosia. And they run a lot of our campaigns for us. We recently had a big ad campaign where the whole creative was made by students um, in Germany. And it is a beautiful TV ad. And we didn't have the budget or the resources to do that ourselves, but our users made it for us as part of a university project. And now through a collaboration with Sky and JC Deco, we've got that creative in 12 European cities. There's been a huge disservice made to consumers where we've made them focus on their personal carbon footprint. And that's something that was actually started by fossil fuel companies, this idea of a personal footprint. And what we actually have is whole societies and economies that we're not taking into consideration their footprint and we're not changing that structure. And we're asking consumers to stop using plastic straws. And that's not going to solve the climate crisis. So we have to look at companies being a lot stronger on this and not trying to make it all about these tiny changes that consumers can make, but actually the huge collective action they can have and the systemic change that needs to follow. Because otherwise we've got consumers trying their absolute hardest to eat less meat, fly less and do all these great things. But on the other hand, companies are continuing business as usual and just say, oh, we're going to hit net zero in 2050. 2050 isn't, is, it's too far away. If we wait to 2050 for companies and countries to hit net zero, we're heading for disaster. So I think anyone who works in marketing and advertising needs to have that personal realization and then realize whose cause they're furthering and having campaigns focused on just people and their behaviors isn't going to be enough. It has to look at actual activism on a larger scale. So we've seen how the growing level of environmental awareness has created obviously opportunities for responsible brands willing to innovate in the right direction. But let's see how they communicate in the third part of our study. So Jean-Baptiste, can you tell us about the partnership solutions for engaging ads? Well, first, as Anna Wicks mentioned earlier, how brands communicate on their green transition is a sensitive issue, and how they make sure they convey the right message is another one. Last year, in the middle of the first lockdown, the Europeans they were asked what they were expecting for brands in terms of communication, and it turned out 
that their immediate need was very focused on solving and helping with the COVID crisis. But longer term expectations didn't disappear. Sustainability and responsibility remain the focus. Okay. With a potential positive outcome of the crisis, we hope so, now is the perfect timing to recapture these topics. But brands are facing a challenge in communicating their responsible initiatives. Despite the fact that most of them have integrated social and environmental challenge in their communication, 40% of Europeans can't name a single responsible brand. And nine out of 10 think it's difficult to determine if a brand really acts responsibly. So how do they deal with this perception gap? Well, our survey shows that some brands manage to emerge as more responsible. And it ranges from smaller to much bigger brands natively environment focused or with a broader focus. So how did they find the right balance? Well, based on semiotics analysis, the British broadcaster ITV tried to pinpoint the right tone and element to convey in a responsible advert. And it's hard to strike a middle ground between a greenwashing approach that leaves the consumer a bit skeptical uh, and an extreme communication angle likely to trigger a feeling of guilt and anxiety. So the key identified elements are reality, practicality, empathy, and a local approach. And so we asked Lucy Crotty, Cultural Insight and Strategy Leader ITV, to tell us about the lessons they learned from this approach. Take a look. From a broadcaster's perspective, first, our goal is to make the biggest shows with the smallest footprint. So we have weaved sustainability into some of the storylines of some of our major UK soaps, such as Coronation Street, Emmerdale. Given that the research that we did, we realised what people wanted were convenient hacks, tips and practical solutions delivered in a really like every man, every woman tone of voice. Corn actually have that with their advertising at the moment, which is saving the, the planet one bite at a time, which I just think is really refreshing. So as part of our home planet proposition, um, we developed four main products uh, that we offer to advertisers and they are Proudly Presents, which introduce um, a brand's new creative. An example of that is Corn, who were our first brand partner, and they use a home planet Proudly Presents to introduce their new creative. Then we have sustainability uh, themed ad break takeovers. We are calling it the Home Wins ad break takeover. So we're going to get seven different advertisers who represent some of the biggest sustainable sins we've called it and through identifying them we then convert that into seven home wins then we have enviro stories which are our kind of branded content um, opportunities and um, that can be contextually fit into the schedule uh, depending on the audience and then we have show partnerships so uh, obviously for a brand like co-op who are currently have a partnerships with uh, coronation street and have also got a sustainability stance and actually we're working towards something that is genuinely really exciting that we haven't done in um, this kind of scale before. The concept will essentially be a environmental takeover day uh, where we will have uh, editorial, marketing and commercial all joined together um, to take over the main channel on the first day of the week of COP26. It is very difficult and sensitive because our social purpose team have done an incredible job in creating the credentials that we have. So we've done two things to combat that. So the first one is that we created Home Planet as a commercial proposition. Very clear that a lot of the activity around Home Planet runs in airtime. That if you want to be a Home Planet partner, that you have to submit what we have created as some brand suitability guidelines. I think finding the synergies between the brand stance and the environment and the commercial stance is really important because it will be seamless for the viewer, but equally, should there be 
a reputational risk, we have those two different points covered. Okay, so if we look at the example of ITV, it is possible to find a middle ground in ethical communication, but how can it translate into clever advertising options? Well, the first approach, Louise, is to be very pragmatic and very straightforward, communicating clear product facts, like the Italian format label lecture that details the composition of the product, or using a very frugal way of creating an ad with basic animations and light colors to express a simple message based on the product's attributes. Brands that are heavily engaged into sustainability, they need the maximum airtime and editorial content to convey their messages. Let's take the example of Barilla. It's the most quoted brand in our survey by Italian consumers. It's acting in multiple ways to suggest a better agriculture and better behavior in nutrition. Well, together with La Rai, they have chosen to showcase their engagement through a four-episode mini-series with the Italian chef Davide Oldani. Okay, so that's a great idea, clever idea. Um, any other initiatives? Yes, 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 there are plenty. Making good use of advertising budget for the greater good of the planet is definitely something we will increasingly suggest advertisers to do. M6 in France is offering advertisers the Ad for Good initiative, for example, to pick an association to whom they will distribute 1% of their advertising budget. The project will be communicated through a frame appearing around the spot. In Germany, the Media Plus Media Agency Group is offering advertisers to compensate the carbon footprint of their advertising campaign by investing 1% of the budget in carbon offsetting. Major sales such as RTL Group's Ad Alliance are actually taking part in the initiative. And as consumers need a little incentive to change their habits, what better than a touch of British humour to encourage sustainable behaviour? I've had meat and two veg every day of my life. I like meat and two veg. This recipe was handed down to me by my great, 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 great grandmother. It's never changed. I literally eat my competitors for breakfast. Me! I love a bit of mammoth. I'm generally a meat guy, but... These corn fillets are well tasty. Plus, eating them could help save the planet in 40,000 years' time. I've just swapped the meat out for corn. And I'm having a corn taco. And it's great! Beef kids don't need beef. I'm having corn and two veg instead. And I'm going fancy for the kids. Ha. Fair play, lad. Fair play. Mm. Help lower your carbon footprint by switching to corn. Helping the planet one bite at a time. And as it happens, here's an interview of Jill Riley, Marketing Director at Corn Food, who will tell us a little bit more about their approach. Corn Foods is a unique uh, brand. It has been around since 1985 in the UK, actually. So we were very revolutionary um, at the time uh, in launching into the meat-free category, and uh, particularly when we look at the, the meat-free category today. We believe that we can provide uh, healthy food for people, their families, and also for the future of the planet. We have a really, really strong ambition actually and we want to become a net positive company by the year 2030. When we look at per capita consumption of meat-free products, uh, the UK is the strongest market globally. That said, the penetration of the category in the UK of the meat-free category is still around 45%, which is really you know, small when you compare um, the penetration to meat, the penetration to breakfast cereals and some of those other categories that we, we, we've known and, and loved for, for years and years. So there is plenty of room for growth. We see in every market that we operate in that growth is uh, double digit in this category retailers give more space to this category all the time and it is set to grow as consumer interest um, and consumer action grows as well there are two reasons why we made the decision to use humor um, really to communicate uh, the benefits of corn and what we are trying to achieve 
Uh, the first one is that um, we knew from our research that um, to excite and engage people in the issue and to really help them understand uh, about the, the, their food choices, sort of going hard with you know sort of big scary images and melting icebergs just was going to feel very far away very distant so although consumers realize that is an issue they don't feel that's an issue that they can have a personal effect on or they can do anything about which really um, we didn't want to happen we also know that you know humor is a great way to drive um, fame within advertising make people stop look engage talk about share and we've seen that certainly with this ad um, in the UK as well it was great for us actually um, working with ITV Home Planet because we have a set of shared values. It really is about making, helping people understand that they can make um, choices uh, within the home really and make small changes to have a big impact on their carbon footprint. So it was a perfect partnership and we found the process really easy and straightforward. And um, they were very supportive of what we were trying to do. Um, they understood our sustainability credentials um, because it's really important that they have belief in what we we are saying and what we are doing and, and they really did believe that um, so that worked well for us. So to sum up the most important outlines of the study the consumers they expect media publishers to tackle the sustainability issue first and foremost by pushing more related topics in their programming but also by limiting environmental impact in production and distribution. The consumption habits they are bound to change in order to limit their global environmental impact. However, behaviors are not evolving in the same way from country to country. As for brands, the ones which are ready to innovate along these lines will be the ones able to enlarge their customer base in the future. Advertising on sustainability is another tricky topic. Dedicated advertising formats can help brands to find the right tone to address the issue. The media industry is due to provide more suited solutions in the future for the brands willing to take the step. Thank you so much, Jean-Baptiste, for sharing all this unique data and these great insights with us. To conclude the show now with a more societal outlook, we're going to turn to someone who teaches people every day to turn stressful issues into positive actions. And I'm going to meet her in Le Restaurant La Source for a quick coffee. Thanks again. Thank you. Charlene, really great to see you. Thanks for being with us. You are a psychotherapist. You work in the south of France, in Montpellier, and in the recent years, you have focused your practice on the notion of eco-anxiety. Now, first of all, tell us what eco-anxiety actually is. Eco-anxiety first arrived in the, in the public sphere uh, in the 1990s in the US. Okay. It's a journalist, Lisa Left, that used it for the first time and it referred to the stress people felt because of an increasing pollution in the Chesapeake Bay. Eco-anxiety can be seen as a pre-traumatic stress. It's a, a prospective suffering that people feel when they imagine the future relative to the ecological crisis. As a therapist, you work with brands as well. Why do they turn to your expertise, Charlene? I work with uh, brands that have acknowledged that some of their employees are suffering from the ecological and social situation. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they are aware of uh, the, the actual crisis. And even if they are really passionate about their job, uh, they are focused on the, the impact the job has on the environment, so which make them feel a lot of guilt. I try to create a secure place where people can talk, where they can share what they are feeling and where they can also understand what caused what they are feeling. Sometimes I guess companies want to go a bit too quickly. Yes, so I advise them that they have to plan a strategy step by step. It's better to think small, but actually do something instead of think big and not being able to match the goals. Of course, so you've got to learn to walk before you can actually run, is that correct? Yes. Um, how are brands actually helping the consumers to deal with this, uh, this problem, eco-anxiety? First, uh, they can show that they are facing the reality of their impact on the environment. Uh, it's a way of uh, reassuring the consumer 
uh, about the fact that they are not in denial. Denial is a psychological mechanism uh, that occurs when uh, reality is too unbearable. So showing uh, that sustainability uh, is part of their strategy or even a priority uh, will help the consumer to work on the, the reduction of uh, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is uh, uh, the gap between someone's judgments, someone's principles and someone's behavior. Mm -hmm. So knowing that they are uh, choosing brands that match their values will help them to, to feel more coherent when they buy something. So you're talking really about transparency. A brand must be as transparent as possible with its consumers. That's really a, a way to reassure the consumer. When a, a lot of brands now use the, the process of um, the life cycle assessment, which show the impact of a product from the manufacturing part until the recycling step. End to end, yeah. And so it sort of reassures us to know how they're going through each process and how they're doing that in an eco-friendly way, I guess. Yeah, so. and they know, and they know what they buy, and they are responsible for what they what buy. They're buying, of course. I mean, I know we're going through an ecological crisis. There's a lot of suffering, but in some cultures we talk about a crisis being an opportunity as well. Would you say that that's the case? Yeah. Brand can really see the opportunity of the crisis to work on the human factor. So they can offer to their employees space where they can talk about their feeling and vulnerabilities. As the ecotherapists say, and I share this opinion, it's by taking care of ourselves as human beings that it will have an impact, a positive impact on the planet. Well, thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us today. It was great to meet you. <laughs> great to meet you too. Thank you. So I think we've all understood there's a long way to go on the path to sustainability. But solutions exist and science is clear, we are still on time. So brands, media players and advertisers should stick together because they have a very important role to play. Well, we're coming to the end of our online event. Thank you so much for being with us and following us. And thanks to the wonderful team that helped put this together. We'll see you very soon. Goodbye.